Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the ABC Bubbles of the World Happy Hour. I'll be your host this evening, host Lauren Brogno, and I'm happy to have with me not one, but four bubble experts from four different places, and they're going to talk about their perspective wines. So let me introduce them all. Representing Mianetto Winery from the Veneto in Italy, we have Enere Ceola. He's the CEO and Managing Director of Fresnet Mianetto USA. Enere, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Ciao, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Great. Our second guest is coming from traveling, um, coming, representing the Henkel Winery in Germany. Her name is Julia Rentes. Julia. Hi, how are you? Hi, thanks for you having me. Those look amazing. Is that a large format in the middle? This is uh, the 750, and then I have two of the Picolos from Henkel. Oh, great. And then moving on, we have, we're going to Spain, and I have Gloria Colel all the way in outside of Barcelona at Segura Vitas. Gloria, hi, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Hola, buenas noches. Hi, thank you for having us. <laughs> and our last but not least guest is Jaleel Simpkins. He's representing the Gloria Ferrer Winery in Sonoma in the Canaros Appalachian. Julia, welcome. Looks beautiful there right now. It's gorgeous out. It's a little warm, but it's, def uh, it's definitely summer here in California. <laughs> Thanks for having me. You're awesome. We're so happy you're with us. Um, start with Prosecco. We're going to jump back to NRA and talk about all about Mionetto. First of all, NRA, tell, tell us a little bit about your history with Mionetto. My history with Mionetto. Well, my history started a long time ago. I'm uh, now I'm uh, 23 years with the company. I, I moved here in, in US in 1997 when we start to sell Mionetto Prosecco in the United States. And, um, you know, it's been a very amazing journey since, uh, since then. You know, the history of Mionetto is very, very long, uh, much longer than the history in the United States, for sure. So Mionetto is one of the oldest winery in the, in the Veneto region of producing Prosecco, especially in the town of Valdo Biadene, which is the heart of Prosecco. Mm -hmm. We have been producing Prosecco since 1887, so over 135 years there. Uh, the family Mionetto has always been uh, very popular for Prosecco, and I will call it the first ambassador of Prosecco because at the beginning they were very popular in Italy, but then they were the first winery to really start to branch outside Italy. First in Austria, then in Germany, then in UK, uh, across Europe, and finally uh, in, in 1997, a year in the United States. So, uh, so the history in in US it's it's quite amazing. You know, when we started in uh, 20 plus years ago, nobody knew Prosecco, but today uh, Prosecco it's it's everywhere. It's something that people really like, enjoy. They get, they know, they understand. And Mionetto is one of the best selling brands and most loved brand in the United States. So, amazing journey, amazing history of the, of the company abroad and here in the United States. <laughs> And can you tell us a little bit of where exactly is the winery? So the winery, it's, it's of course, is in Italy. Now, if anybody has been to Italy, um, but it was not, just close your eyes and think about the, the Italy is the boot. So we are on the northeast of the boot of Italy, right on the border with Austria and close to the border with Germany. It's, we are only 45 minutes of Venice. Uh, so you land at the airport in Venice, you, you take a, a car, and you know, in less than an hour, you are in the heart of the Prosecco in Valdo Biadene. It's a beautiful country. It, it starts you know, in a flat area around Venice, and as you get close to Valdo Biadene, you start to get to the hills, and it goes up and up and up, up to get to Valdo Biadene, where the, the vineyards are so steep, you can even go with the, with the regular machines there. Everything is done by hand. It, it's a beautiful place for the vineyard, a beautiful place for the vines, and of course, beautiful place for the food, like in, all, all over Italy. Um, Mioneto is in the heart of, of the Prosecco, which is Valdo Biadene, and the wine that we are tasting to, today comes from the DOC Treviso. 
the DOC Treviso, it's very important for us because this the original um, vineyards where the, the glera has been growing for the last three, four hundred years. So it is the tradition of winemaking there that is specifically tied to glera prosecco. Mm -hmm. And Mianetto was one of the first wineries established in 1887, is that correct? You're right, one of the oldest. Maybe not the oldest, maybe the second oldest, but I will say one of the oldest for sure. Mm -hmm. So should we taste yeah, it? Long history. Absolutely, can't wait for that, right? So <laughs> tonight we are tasting uh, the Prosecco Brut. Um, for convenience, I'm opening a small one, but we have, you know, of course, 750, and even for large party, 1.5, and even three liter if you have a real big party. But <laughs> we'll make it easier tonight, right? So, so Prosecco Brut, Mioneto, no? What is so special? Well, first of all, um, I will say Prosecco, generally speaking, it's special because it's an amazing wine that uh, you can drink, you know, at any time of the day. Uh, some people drink it even for breakfast, to be honest with you, but uh, whatever, it's, it's breakfast, lunch, brunch, or dinner, or before dinner, or after dinner, there's always a good time for Prosecco. Prosecco is very pleasant because it's very low in, um, in, in alcohol, you know, very low in sulfite because it does, the second fermentation is very short, so and the wine is meant to be drunk very young, so we don't add a lot of uh, sulfite to preserve the wine. And the bubbles are very fine and persistent, and uh, one of the best Prosecco that you are tasting tonight uh, is the Mioneto, and I, I like it a lot because it's really well balanced. There's a great balance of bubbles, a great balance of sugar, a great balance of acidity, and finally of yeast. So the main characteristic of Prosecco, and especially Mioneto, in your nose, it's it's the apple, the green apple, a little bit of peach, and awning. A great, great fruit forward a wine that really is what it makes it very, very unique. And then you know when you when you drink it, it's very refreshing, crisp and clean. You know, and the bubbles are very fine and persistent, and that's a, a very good sign of a great quality well-made sparkling wine. And Prosecco is something that you want to enjoy young, is that correct? Correct. You, you know, unlike other great sparkling wines like Champagne or Cava that, you know, they can age longer, Prosecco, you don't want to age it. It's not a wine that is meant to be aged, it's a wine that's meant to be drink young. The younger, the better. So you want to be sure that, you know, if you get a bottle of, of, of Prosecco, you drink it within, you know, a few weeks, if not a few days. If it's my home, maybe it's a few hours, you know, sometimes. But, <laughs> you know, it's, you, you want to drink it quick, you know, keep it in your fridge as long as it gets cold and then enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. What are some things you like to pair with this? Oh, uh, you know, pr Prosecco is very easy. Uh, it, it goes with pizza, you know, very casual. But then it can go, you know, with a very delicate uh, seafood plate. Like it can be, you know, carpaccio di tuna or even a salmon, um, a grilled salmon, or even shrimp. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's very versatile. Uh, I like it very much. Um, usually, especially in the summertime, you know, you have a good salad with, with uh, mozzarella or you have a good salad with, uh, with some shrimp. It's, it's an amazing way to start your meal, sometimes to end the meal as well. That sounds amazing, very delicious. Thank you so much for yeah. your information. Now we're going to move over to Germany and talk to Julia Renz, who represents Henkel for the United States. Thank you. Julia, thank you so much for joining us. It's nice to see you. Tell me Hi. a little bit about Henkel. Where is it so, exactly? So Henkel is in Germany and it's located in um, the central western region and it's um, about 30 minutes from Frankfurt, west of Frankfurt, right on the north side of the Rhine River. And it's, um, Henkel is based in the city of, the city is called Wiesbaden and it's the main city in the Rheingau region which is um, one of the 13 regions that are recognized in Germany for quality wine production. 
And um, tell me a little bit about the history of this sparkling wine because it's called Henkel Brut, but it's also a sparkling sect. Is that correct? Yes. So sect means sparkling wine in, uh, in German. And so if you'll go and order a glass of sect in Germany, you're going to be getting a, a nice glass of bubbles. Um, and the history of um, sect and of the Henkel sect starts way back in 1832 uh, when Adam Henkel um, had a, a wine shop. So he was selling wine and as he was learning about wine, he got more and more interested in sparkling wine and how it's produced, how it's made. So he decided to go to, to France and learn a little bit from the Champagne masters. So in the Champagne region, they had already been making um, sparkling wine and Champagne for quite some time. So he went there and learned and kind of like stole some of their secrets and uh, came back to Germany in 1856 and started his own um, company, Henkel. And so since then, he's been uh, producing sparkling wine and selling it and kind of like mixing and balancing out the, um, the French cuvee making, so the secrets of Champagne with uh, uh, German craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. uh, craftsmanship. Um, and since the early 900s, Henkel had become a very popular sparkling wine all over Germany and started it uh, becoming uh, more and more uh, exported and a global brand. And um, as of today, uh, it's exported in uh, over 100 countries, U.S. included. Wow, that's amazing. And let's speak specifically about this Henkel Brut. Um, the blend are just indigenous varietals from um, this area in Germany? Yes. So the blend is um, some Chardonnay and some of the indigenous varietals from um, the Frankfurt and Rheingau area. Um, so it's a nice um, pale yellow color. And if you start smelling it, it you, you're getting hit right away from, by some nice, intense, fruity, um, tropical fruits uh, aromas. And it's delicious, actually, very well balanced. It's very well balanced. The bubbles are very subtle and, um, and persistent. Uh, I've opened the bottle uh, before we started, and I don't know if you can see the bubbles are still floating in the glass. Um, it's very refreshing. It, had the, it has a nice fruitiness um, to it. And one thing that I learned while I was in Germany um, is that the people love to drink it uh, by adding some um, strawberries to it. So that oh, as you're yeah. drinking it, stra the strawberries release some of more of their red fruit flavors and they change the color of the wine a little bit more pink and it makes it a perfect, delicious drink for the summer. Mm, I'm gonna try that, definitely. I have not tried that yet. That sounds really good. <laughs> I love strawberries. Thanks for the recommendation. Of course. Cool. Julia, thank you so much. Sect is a very cool item that I'm going, would like to enjoy more. <laughs> I appreciate all your knowledge about Henkel. Now we're going to travel south to Spain and speak with my friend Gloria Colel at Segura Vides. Gloria, first of all, thank you for staying up late for us and welcome. It's so nice to have you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, my dear Rachel. Uh, yes, I mean, there are better ways of enjoying a Friday night. For me, it's 11.20 uh, on a Friday night. But, well, at least I have a glass of Segura Vidas to, with me, which is, which is good. And I know that you are, you are behind the screens and I, we can share all this together. Mm -hmm. I started uh, with Segura Vidas many years ago more than 20 years ago. I was born in a family dedicated to wine. And um, well, I have wine in my blood and I feel it and my hobbies are dedicated to wine. So wine is, is, is probably my, my life. Uh, and, and, and when I started at Segura Vida as a, being part of the winemaking team, um, I could feel the, 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 the the relevance of Segura Viudas as a winery, as a state. Mm -hmm. and, and, and since then, I've been dedicating part of my life um, 
helping uh, to spread the, the, the history and the voice of Segura Viudas all over the world. And now I'm the wine manager at Segura Viudas, supporting all our customers and, 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 and distributors all over the world. What a great opportunity. But tell me exactly where is this Cava region? Where are you located? Segura Viudas is quite, quite close to Barcelona. We are in north, uh, northeast of Spain, so like 35 minutes south driving from Barcelona. Mm -hmm. and, and well, as you can see, we are very close to the Mediterranean Sea. We have a beautiful climate conditions, beautiful weather. Uh, today, we, we had a beautiful day already, sun all the time. So climate conditions, soil conditions, the growing conditions for the vineyards, are superb, are excellent. And, and although we have the four seasons, but uh, we do have very good conditions for the, for the vines to grow, for the local grapes, to, to have quite a stable harvest throughout the years. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful area to visit and I strongly recommend to, to visit us. It looks fantastic. What about the, um, the winery itself of Segura Vidas? It's a rather old building, right? Tell us about it. See, see, see definitely. I, I think we probably are maybe the oldest winery in the region because the, the state where I'm, I mean, the building where I'm now, um, although outside there is today, tonight, there is a concert outside. There are 300 people enjoying a concert and, and drinking Segura Vidas Cava together with some Catalan food. Uh, but I'm, I'm working from a building which dates back from the 12th century. And, and in fact, this house, we, we, we found some documents were, that are saying that this house was called the, the Grape House uh, back in the, in the 12th century. So, and I think we we'll talk already with you about that, the responsibility that, that you feel when you know that any generations before you have been working, growing the vineyards, um, dedicating their lives to grow the vineyards, to make wine, to keep traditions. So for us, it's really a responsibility of sustainability, uh, keeping the traditions, but also thinking on the future, thinking on innovation and what we should do, which is the, which is the message we are, we are giving to the future generations. And, 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 and nowadays, this is even more important, yeah? because I mean, we are having tough times and, yeah. and, and this is very important that our legacy to the future generations. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it's a beautiful place to work. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. So let's move to the tasting of the wine. We have, tonight we have the Segura Vides Brut Cava. And tell me about this, this product. What are the grapes? So this is our hero uh, we let's say 70% of our total production is, is for that brood which which says a lot about the product because this is a this is a long aging uh, cava cava is a second uh, is a second uh, fermentation in the bottle so we in a way we call it method champenoise or method traditionnel which means that the second fermentation has been done inside the bottle uh, meaning that the, the concentration, the complexity of the wine is, is quite high. And, and this is a cava made with the three typical grapes from our area, which are local grapes, not easy to pronounce. And uh, they are called Macabeo, Charello, and Parellada. So the, the, those are <laughs> Catalan grapes, local grapes. We always grow with, with local and ancient grapes. And, and this is a long aging product. It has been grow, it has been aged in the bottle for more than 13, 14 months, which means that we, we will have some primary aromas, primary fruits, of course, mm -hmm. of course, but also we'll have all this bread, all those bakery, walnuts, dry fruits, aromas that come from the second fermentation. Okay, so there is a lot of citrus also, primary aromas, apples, but a lot of this complexity, honey, and, and, and complex fruits from the second fermentation. At mm -hmm. the same time, this is a dry product. It's a brood, which means that only 
seven, nine grams of sugar had been added just to, to have this easy going. But this is a complex and, and perfect cava to have throughout the meal. It is delicious. Yeah, we always we also ask pairing recommendations. Mm -hmm. We like to have it together with paella. You know that here in Spain we do paella, we do rice, uh, or even a risotto. We like it very much. And uh, but thanks to the complexity and to the dryness, you can have it throughout the whole meal. Right. It is. It's delicious. Thank you. So Thank you. <laughs> so now we're going to leave Europe, travel. <laughs> to California and talk to Julio Simpkins, the wine educator at Global Prayer. Julio, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? It Doing looks well. Like right now. Wow, what a beautiful day. Beautiful out, no yeah. doubt. Nothing but blue sky. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Right, because we're in uh, the Carneros growing region here mm -hmm. in Sonoma County, in Sonoma, California, of the U.S. of A. We are getting a we do almost every day this nice breeze that rolls through here coming from the uh, Petaluma Wind Gap um, because we are just east of the Pacific Ocean. So even when it's hot here, we get a little bit of natural air conditioning. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. So tell me about um, the history of Gloria Ferrer. Um, so Gloria Ferrer um, was back in uh, 1982 to 1986 when the property that we're on, uh, which was once a sheep and cow farm was purchased um, mm -hmm. by the family behind La Frexenera, or Freshenet, Jose and Gloria Ferrer, um, coming from uh, wine making or wine growing families from as far back as the 1500s. They uh, founded Freshenet back in 1914 and fast forward about 70 years and they uh, sought to uh, find land and begin producing wine um, in the new world. So here in California. So, uh, by comparison, we are obviously a, a the young, a, a very young uh, sparkling winery. Um, however, we were the first sparkling winery here in the Carneros growing region, uh, just about a year um, after the property was purchased, um, about 207 uh, uh, acres, give or take, uh, in total on this property. Um, mm -hmm. Just about a year, later, the Carneros AVA, or American Viticulture Area, was established. Mm. Very so cool. Gloria, her name is on the winery. Um, that was a, um, you know, uh, Jose Ferrer saw her as his muse. So he thanked her by naming the winery after her. Um, you know, it's, it's his wife. What better gift than to name a winery after your loved one? That does sound like a terrific gift. And what an adventure for them to explore the new world and be one of the first ones to charge into the California wine region and develop this and see a vision that this would be the perfect spot in Caneros in Sonoma for a winery. Very cool. It actually reminded them much of uh, their home. Um, and as uh, Gloria Buras mentioned, uh, Freshenet is actually, you know, sister winery and just up the road, uh, northwest of Barcelona by comparison in Pinedas uh, uh, in Catalonia. Um, so they actually found that the Mediterranean climate here was actually very similar and unique uh, to uh, this part of California, you know, the sloping hills, the being just north of the San Pablo Bay in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, we definitely get this cool weather um, that allows us to grow grapes. Mm, that sounds like the perfect spot to me. Uh, there we go. There's the map. I, I talked all about it, but <laughs> so it was the first <laughs> day established back in 1983 for Sonoma, um, one mm -hmm. of 17 ABAs that now exist um, in this growing region. Uh, I think this map actually is missing the, oh no, the Petaluma Wind Gap was the most recent established ABA. Mm -hmm. It was back in 2016, but we're right there. So we're right off the main road and you can see our proximity to the San Pablo Bay right underneath the little yellow arrow there. Um, yeah. And you can see the to the Pacific Ocean as well. So the breeze that I mentioned comes through the Petaluma Wind Gaps from the, the warring currents that are out on the Pacific Ocean that drive this air through this area. So our grapes are getting a natural air conditioning and usually around 2 or 3 p.m. every day, we have to every start day looking, this wind, right? Make, make sure that uh, we don't have to turn any of them down for fear of them Mary Poppinsing into the vineyard. <laughs> so let's speak a little bit 
about the wine. Today we're drinking the Gloria Fuerza Roma Brut. And this is your signature property, is that correct? Yes, this is our flagship wine. It was the first wine we ever had in our menu back when we opened our doors back in 1986. Um, to this day, much like a lot of the sparkling wine that has been showcased today, um, it is uh, about 60% of our production. So this is our, our bread and butter. You know, it's our flagship, the, the golden child, if you will. Um, it's a blend of 90% Pinot Noir and 10% Chardonnay. Um, so we are using the grapes found in things such as Champagne, um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, it is a gold color though, because it doesn't receive any contact with the Pinot Noir skins. Um, with wines such as our Brut Rosé or our Blanc de Noir, um, this wine is going to be citrusy. Uh, it is aged inside the bottle in the traditional method or method champenois, whatever you fancy, um, for about 18 months. So uh, like the wines that have been talked about today, um, it does have a little bit of that mousse, that bread-like characteristic. Um, but because we harvest our grapes earlier in the season, um, in August typically, we are capturing the grapes when they have a higher acidity and a lower natural sugar. Um, and that's going to bring that citrusy component to the wine. What are some things that you like to pair with this? Uh, so if I'm being uh, good, then I will <laughs> pair with light, like a Caesar salad or, or seafood. Um, but if I'm feeling guilty, then I might do uh, something breaded, such as like calamari or even like a fried chicken dish. Anything that has a fat component is going to be complemented by uh, something that is acidic. So it's the same idea pouring lemon all over a, a piece of salmon or squeezing lemon over calamari. You've got the acid um, coming from the citrus and then you've got the fat to complement it coming from your food selection. Mm, fried chicken sounds delicious. Thank you so much for your your information about Gloria Ferrer. So Fantastic. We've tasted with all four of our experts and now we're going to open up the panel for some questions. And I have my first question is actually for NRA. I wanted to talk about um, your choice of glassware. You don't have a flute. What is your preference for drinking sparkling wine? Um, can you hear you? My preference is, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. now I can. Yeah. <clears throat> I like this kind of glass, you know, I don't know if you can see it well, it, not the real flute, you know, Prosecco, it's very fruity and it's, it's fruit forward. So you want to have a very a, a larger amount of the glass so you can enjoy the fruit of, of, uh, of, of the sparkling wine Prosecco. So that will be my favorite, you know, something like this or even a regular white wine glass will be work, will be, um, will be fine too. I want, to do, I want to do a flute for Prosecco. I don't think it's the best way to enjoy it. Because you can smell more from the glass being open, correct? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can, you can, you know, the wine is to breathe. You get all the, the nice conviviality of the Italians, you know, mm -hmm. from this, this large amount of, 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 of glass. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's great. I have a question for Gloria. Gloria, can you expand a little more on the sustainability of Segura Vitas? What specifically, what are the practices there? Yeah, sustainability means to do the minimum treatments uh, to the land, the minimum necessary to have a, a growing season. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, like this year, for instance, we, we had a, a terrible May, and, and the June has been, has been also quite rainy, so we probably will we have a high risk of illnesses. So the, the thing is that try to minimize the, treat, the chemical treatments to the vineyard, but at least to guarantee the future harvest. But in that way, the, the thing is that to maintain the, the, the sustainability of the area, to let the animals, to let the, the butterflies, uh, to grow the birds, because if you see a vineyard uh, and you don't see grass, you don't see butterflies, you don't see the animals around, it means that the vineyard is not healthy. So, I mean, the vineyard needs to be in a, in a, in a perfect balance together with the, with the landscape. 
uh, and this is what we what we what we fight for every day. So the, the, this is the meaning of sustainability. Right, that is very important and helps for future generations. It so is. It is. That is like needed for practicing for winemaking. Moving to Julia, how are you doing? That's some questions about Henkel. I want to know more about the harvest during um, during the fall for Henkel. When does it usually begin for the Chardonnay? Uh, it usually begins towards the end of September, maybe moving towards uh, the beginning of October, uh, mostly because we're at a higher latitude. We're uh, in a northern uh, region uh, of Europe, and so Overall, like throughout the year, the temperatures are a little cooler and the, grape needs, um, the grapes need a little longer to mature and to get to that full ripeness um, that is needed to create um, the sparkling wine. Hmm. I would like to do harvest there. That sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I know at Gloria Ferrer, Julio, harvest is a little bit more challenging because they don't do it during the day. Is that correct? No, we do not harvest during the day. We actually start our harvest at about 2 a.m. And the reason for that is uh, it is Mediterranean here, but being a Mediterranean climate, we are also subject to uh, great varieties of weather. Uh, we had rain here, considering what it looks like today. Um, three weeks ago, uh, on a Saturday, um, we recently reopened our tasting room um, following the temporary closure of most wineries guys are experiencing yourselves uh, and the first day we were supposed to reopen there was rain warnings and unfortunately rain early in the season like this or during this part of the ripening season can delay harvest um, or at times it can push it forward so back in 2016 we started our harvest uh, August uh, 3rd and uh, we harvest early in the morning because we want to keep the grapes nice and cool um, so we don't have the grapes uh, bursting or being exposed to oxygen, which is beginning the fermentation process. So all of our um, hands-on harvesters, all the vineyard crew, um, actually started about 2 a.m. and will go till about noon. Um, whole cluster, hand harvesting, um, you, the entire season. Wow, that's incredible. What? That's real dedication to, <laughs> to harvest. But it keeps the workers cool, it keeps the grapes cool, it mm -hmm. can, makes them less prone to breakage. Right, makes sense. That's good. I have another question for NRA. This Mionetto Prosecco is labeled Doc Treviso. How is that different from DOCG, from other docs? Why is it Doc Treviso? Treviso, you know, it's like a, it's like a, it's an appellation, right? So, mm -hmm. so it, it's a proof of quality. You know, Treviso is different uh, from a general Prosecco, different from DOCG. DOCG is a higher quality, but of course it's more expensive than 12 or $13 a bottle. You are more on $18, $20. But, but Treviso for us, it's very important because it is the area where the, the vines of Glera and Prosecco have been growing there for, 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 year, for hundreds of years. So there is a viticulture and a winemaking um, you know, history there that is important for, for the quality of the wine is, is important for us as well. So most of our vineyards and our farmers are located in DOC Treviso and, and that's where the area they wanna, we think it's, it's one of the best DOC Prosecco that we can find it. Hmm. So it's a level of quality, that's, that's very good to know. Correct. I wanted to, yeah. I have no further questions, but I, I have a question myself. But from each country, how do you say cheers? I'm in Italy with Enrique, and well, I'm going to say. Well, we say salute to everyone, right? Salute in Italy. I go over to Germany. Julia, what do you say? You say Posen. Posen. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go south over to Spain. Gloria, how do you say cheers? In Barcelona, we say salud. Salud. And finally, right to California, where we say cheers. Right, Julio? <laughs> Bottoms up. 
<laughs> that too. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the ABC Bubbles of the World. It was fantastic to jump around to each country and explore different bubbles. Thank you, and thank you, ABC, for let us doing this. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Salud. Cheers. Salute. Thank you. Thank you, Cheers. all of you. Salud. Cheers. Have a good weekend. <laughs> we wake you Salute. here. Come and visit us. <laughs>